history. The history of the church. These are my two favorite subjects. And if you were to ask me, what did you study this week? I would say I studied both of those. Because I studied church history. Because I want to know from history how they were and how, what they did. So I don't make the same mistakes as a church and as a pastor of a church. I, I don't want to make the same mistakes. Amen? We don't want to ride off to the, in the Crusades with swords killing the Muslims. You, you don't want to do that? They can do that to us, but we don't want to do that in retaliation. Because how many of you know the church did that? Right? You know, in the name of Christ. In the name of God, you know. So that doesn't paint a really good picture. That, that's more Old Testament living in the New Testament. That's what God did in the Old Testament. That's not what He does in the New Testament. Okay, you're going to have to help me out today. I know you're probably tired and cold and sleepy, but you just have to react with me. Can you do that today? Okay, we got you now. So the transition, one of the most difficult transitions to make in our minds, because it's always in our thoughts, and ultimately it becomes a part of our lifestyle, is from go, moving from the Old Testament to the New Testament. When we talk about the goodness of God and His promises to us as believers, we, we need to ask ourselves the question, and or, or I have had people over the years ask me the question about some of the Old Testament things that happened. I've had people all the time, they ask you, um, well, well, what about this? And I go, well, that was Old Testament. We're in the New Testament now. It's very hard to kind of differentiate, that's the right word, between that and this sometimes. Because when somebody gets sick, I've had people over the years, I, I believe that God, it's the will of God to heal. Can I just say that? I believe it's the will of God to heal. Now, a lot of times people have asked me the question, well, what about Job? What? Old Testament. In the New Testament, every person who was sick that came to Jesus got healed. Not everybody got healed in the Old Testament. It was a different place. It was a different transition. And you've got to make that transition in your head. And so we get stuck in this question mark when we get sick. I'm just using that as an illustration this morning, okay? Do you catch that? I can say it like this. Job is the question. Jesus is the answer. Okay? The Old Testament was always there for a reason. It's, it's part of our foundation. And what we need to understand about the Old Testament is that the Old Testament has examples, principles, teachings, and all kinds of things that were, what happened in the Old Testament. And they are important for us, but they are not to trump the answer or the revelation that we find in Jesus. Did you catch that? I didn't confuse you? Okay. In other words, it has no authority. It, doesn't, it can't trump the authority of Jesus and what He did and demonstrated in the New Testament. Okay, a lot of churches and a lot of Christians, they, they mix the old, a lot of Old Testament truth in with the New Testament truth. And that's why you get a... a, a, a a picture distorted, that's a good point. Thank you, Diane. A, a distorted picture of the goodness of God sometimes. Because sometimes in the Old Testament, it didn't always look like he was good. It looked like he was kind of bad. He kind of, you know, he, he says, go and wipe out that whole nation. Go kill him. That doesn't sound too good to me, does it? So, so we got to kind of, we got to kind of work this out, and it's not an easy transition. Let me tell you something: it is not easy. I've grown up in church all of my life, and and I still get get messed up sometimes. 
I know you don't believe that, really, <coughs> but it's actually true. Uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, and you, you grow up in a church, if you grow up in a church and also become a part of a church group that are very, that do a lot more Old Testament kind of teaching and a lot more Old Testament kind of theology to their doctrine, a doctrine to their theology or whatever you want to call it, th then it makes the church really harsh. Don't step out of line. God's going to get you. Yeah? Anybody ever experienced those kind of churches? You know, the, the Catholic Church is, 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 has some things that I think are still crossed over. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I, I'm not bagging them or anything like that. I'm just saying that they still have some stuff within their religion. They believe in Jesus. That's the good thing. Can you say amen? And, and <clears throat> anyhow, I'm just, I'm not going to go any, whoa, well, okay. Well, thanks, Steve. I'm not going to go any further than that. But nevertheless, nevertheless, the crossover is, is hard for some people. It's true? So they, they uh, I mean, you got to do penance. You got to do works. You got to do certain things. So um, it's, it's a very interesting thing. Um, I won't, I can't settle all the, the questions. Um, uh, the Old Testament is, is set the stage, and what it is, the Old Testament has set the stage for what Jesus taught in the New Testament. Okay, um, and I want to settle some a couple of questions from the Old Testament that caused people to question the goodness of God, or or that God heals the goodness of God and how good and loving and caring and, and wonderful He is. I can't settle all those questions about God's goodness and, and kindness. But what I can do is just give you a couple of truths that the Old Testament laid a foundation for so that now we can, we can take hold of that. The Bible says this. Let me just say it like this. The Bible says it like this. It says that the Old Testament was a teacher to lead us to Christ. Okay? Everything done really in the Old Testament was to lead us to the truth of Jesus Christ and the revelation that we have in Him. Okay? So, there's prototypes in the Old Testament. There are things that God did back there He doesn't do now in the sense. Okay? Because that was the foundation that we could then build our lives on in Christ. Jesus Christ... The Bible says is he's the chief cornerstone. And you and I are living stones built into his house. We're like a stone. He's the chief cornerstone that holds the, all of it together. But we're built into him. The foundation is pretty much the Old Testament. But it's also Jesus. Catching that? Okay, so... The Old Testament, it was for a few basic principles, and I can't go into all of them. It was given to reveal a few basic truths. One of those is to reveal the severity of sin. Sin is a bad thing. Wow, that was deep. <laughs> There's consequences for sin. True? In the Old Testament, if a son was just rebellious, if you had this rebellious son that never obeyed you and never did anything, you could actually stone him to death. That's crazy, isn't it? You almost think like, oh, that's bad. But it's to demonstrate that the severity of sin, the severity of rebellion against God or against a certain thing, it, 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 there's consequences for it. And mankind, left to himself, will continue to go down a road of sin that brings consequences. Okay? 
So the Old Testament needed to lay a foundation for mankind to understand that sin has consequences and it's severe. It's called hell for eternity. <laughs> yeah? Okay, there's, there, I don't want people to go to hell. I, I, years ago, I preached this whole sermon on, on hell and, and, you know, saw some people saved, but I don't want to scare people into salvation. Because <laughs> if, you, if you get saved because you're scared of going to hell, then you need more than that. Okay, the fear of the Lord can lead you to him, but it won't keep you there. Okay? So what we need is we need to understand that sin has consequences and is severe. So in other words, the Old Testament painted an extreme. He says, just go and wipe out all of those people over there because they're so filled with ungodliness and sin that it will contaminate everything else around it. Isn't it strange how... Samuel, I think, was told to go and kill everything with Agag. Agag was a fag. I mean, he was queer. He, he was a poof, okay? Can I just say it like that? Am I being nasty today? I shouldn't have been so, so blunt, should have I? Okay, sorry. That just kind of came out. Sometimes that happens because we got things in us that just come out. <laughs> sorry. So, what? But God told him to kill everything and the livestock. Everything. The sheep and everything. The animals. Everything that was around there. Don't take any of it. I thought that was, that's severe. God, what do you say? Take, kill it all? Yeah. Kill everything. Oh, wow. Jeez. And the reason for that is because it's just a demonstration or it's an understanding that that everything that was in their, their lives and everything that revolved around their lives was corrupted and, 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 and just bad. So you have to wipe it out. I mean, Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, the, the people in the world go, see, oh, God was really bad. And he just killed all these people and he wiped them all out. He gave them all a chance. Right? I could really paint a bad picture of God, couldn't I, if I wanted to? Can we do that? Okay, because, because the Old Testament really did paint that picture. The, the second thing that I really need you to see is the fact is, is that when the Old Testament, it paints the picture of the severity of sin, but it, it also says to us, number two, that, that it reveals to us the lostness of man. That... that Without God, there is no hope of salvation. So we have to see our need for Jesus. Israel was always looking forward to a Messiah who was going to save them and redeem them. Prophecy after prophecy after prophecy in the Old Testament was leading to this Messiah who would come and rescue the world and save the world and redeem mankind from themselves. So there's two things that people need to see in the world today. Even today, they still need to recognize the fact that they are lost without God and they are, are going to experience the severity of their sin in going to hell. Amen. That's what's going to happen. I wish that wouldn't happen, but because God is a just and a holy and a righteous God, on the other side of the coin, He's merciful, gracious, and kind. Yeah. Old Testament really revealed this... The, the righteousness, the holiness, the purity, the justice of God, where the New Testament begins to reveal in Christ Jesus the grace, the love, and the kindness of God. You have to have both. And they live in tension. Mercy and, 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 and justice live in this tension. Justice of God cannot allow this to go on un, un, unpunished. How many of you know that? 
The holiness of God can't let that continue on. So he sends his son to be the, the payment for it. So now we can experience mercy. Amen? There's elements of God's mercy and grace and all of that through the Old Testament, but not like in the New Testament because the purpose of the Old Testament was always to demonstrate and to show to mankind that God is serious about the wrongs that are in the world. And they have to be dealt with. And that He's given you the answer to the, to the, to the question or to the problem. And the question or the answer is Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Can you say amen? Not through any other religion, not through any other way, but it's through Jesus Christ. So, so we need a Savior. Do you need a Savior? We need somebody to help us with this, this whole situation at hand. Okay? So, Hebrews. Everybody good? See, I take so long. I, I write a whole stack of notes. And then what I do is I just get through a portion of my notes. Because I start to illustrate it and then I go off on a tangent. And you guys do that to me all the time. You make me do that. Now, did you catch that? Old Testament reveals the severity of God and the lostness of man. Correct? Tells us that we are lost without God. We need a Savior. And so, um, you know, if you're witnessing to people in the world that don't know God, those are the two things that you need to let them know about. You know the Ten Commandments? They're not for believers. Well, they are for believers because you don't want to go off and do... <laughs> you don't want to go do the wrong thing with the Ten Commandments, right? But we don't really need those because the law of God is now written upon our hearts. Christ is in us. He, he helps us to live out righteously. He's not only our righteousness, but he helps us to live righteous. Can you say amen? Right? But, but the unsaved need sometimes the, the Ten Commandments. You need to take them down that road sometimes. Well, my life is good. I'm okay. Nothing wrong with me. This is a sinner. Right? You say, no, 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 hold on a minute. Have you ever lied? Well, yeah, but everybody lies. Well, not everybody, but yeah, that's true. They need to be brought to a point where they realize that lying, cheating, stealing, committing adultery, all of those things is sin. Are you okay? Okay? So, so they have to be brought to that place where the, that, that this sin, the soul that sins will surely die. Right? So anyhow, so at, some, at some point in time, things get bad. Okay. All right. It's all good. Lostness of man. Okay. In Hebrews in chapter 1, let's read for verse 1. Now, who is this letter being written to? Cool, man, you guys are smart. Thank you, Heather. Thank you for telling that to everybody else in this place that didn't know that. Thank you very much. <laughs> so it's written to the Jews, right? Yep. Yep. Does anybody know why? Because they lost everything, or they were about to lose everything in AD 70. Yeah, but that, that's true. Yeah, Any, anything else? Any other reasons why you think this is being written to them? Everything was replaced with Jesus? Okay, I'll just throw a couple things at you. Hebrews is written to the Jews to tell the Jewish people that Jesus is the better covenant. They had an old covenant and they found it very hard to let go of the old covenant. They kept doing the practices of the old covenant. They kept holding on to the Old Testament. What are we talking about today? The crossing over from transition from old to new. Correct? Okay, we might not be as bad as the Jewish people of that time. 
when this letter is being written to them and instructions being given to them, but these instructions are being given to them because they are struggling, struggling to let go of this past, this, this thing this called Judaism or their religion. It wasn't just their religion. The problem with people today is that we just add Christianity onto as an accessory to our lives. We work, and it's our workplace. That's part of our life. We go home, it's, our family is a part of our family. This is our family. Then we, we, then we go to uh, the sporting field, and that's part of our life and our experiences. Or we ride motorbikes because we love riding motorbikes. And I like old cars. And so this, and we put them in categories, and then all of a sudden we come to church on Sunday, and we've got our spiritual life together now. It's like an add-on to our accessory. Well, to the Jewish people, their, their, their home, their family, their business, their sports, every part of their life was all wrapped up into one. It was their whole life. Their religion was their whole life. It, was, it involved everything. Their kids would go to the synagogue. They, it was part of their life every day. Christianity, to me, is part of my life every day. I wake up worshiping God. I wake up reading my Bible. I read my Bible. I think of Jesus all day long. And my wife. And my grandkids. But it, it, it's not like an accessory. It's not like all of a sudden I go to church on Sunday and all of a sudden I've just added this spiritual part to my life on. Everybody catching that? Okay? So it's very important that... that we understand this about the Hebrews. So they were finding it very hard to transition from the old to the new and experience something. In a sense, they didn't even want this. That's why they rejected Jesus Christ. They rejected Jesus because he was bringing something new to the table. And they already believed they had God. They had the temple. That's where the presence of God was. They had, they had everything they needed. They didn't need a new, you know, go away, Jesus. Get lost. We don't need you. And he's saying, no, that's, that's not what you need. You think you need that, but that's not what you need. You need me. Okay? So, so this is what the book of Hebrews is really all about. It's telling them Jesus is the way. He's the high priest. He's the better covenant. He's the better... Uh, um, you know, everything. How many know Jesus is the better everything? True? Okay. So let's read in verse 1. Listen to what this says. This is a great, great, uh, I like this um, few verses here. And this is always, whenever they start out writing a letter, the introduction is very important for you to catch because it, it lays the foundation for the rest of the book. You catch that? God, who at various times and in various ways uh, spoke in time past. Did you catch that? To the fathers, to our fathers, or to the fathers by the prophets. In other words, God at different times and in different places in the past spoke to us through the prophets, through the teachers, through people like Moses, and all these kind of different people, that's how God used to speak to us. Correct? Has in these last days, or in these days right now, spoken to us by His Son, whom He has appointed heir of everything, of all things through whom also he made the worlds. In other words, Jesus, he's the heir of everything. He's going to be the guy that gets it all. Amen? Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, he is set down at the right hand of the majesty on high. In other words, Jesus, um, 
when, when it says here that Jesus is the express image of God's person, the brightness. Okay, the moon at nighttime is a reflection of the sun. Right? A full moon, you can actually, it, it actually can be quite light at night. You ever gone out at night and went, wow, it's quite bright tonight. Because a full moon is giving you a, an exact perfect reflection of the sun. The moon has no light of itself. No light of itself. The earth has no light of itself. It doesn't generate any light at all. Correct? It's just a reflection. The Old Testament saints and the old, like Abraham and Moses and these guys and the prophets of old, they were like a reflection, like the moon, the full moon on a night when the sun is hitting it, they're like a reflection to us about God. You can't see Him exactly perfect. And, and the moon isn't giving you its own light. It's just a reflection. Did you catch that? That's the Old Testament. But Jesus is the sun. Good point to say amen to. Jesus is the sun. The Nicene Creed says he is light of lights. <laughs> Jesus says I am the light of the world. You've got to sing that. World. You don't have to sing it? Why not? <laughs> okay? So that's what that says there in Hebrews. That Jesus isn't just a reflection like everybody was in the Old Testament. He is actually the exact same as that sun. He is light of light. He is God of God. Amen? He is it. There you go. I am that I am. You know, isn't that a wonderful idea? That when I see Jesus, see, when I see the Old Testament saints, when I see the Old Testament prophets, I get a, a version of God that's kind of like the moon. On a full moon night, you kind of get a little bit more. On a half moon night, you got to get a little bit. On a quarter of a moon, you kind of get a little bit less. Correct? You don't get a full picture. You don't get the full essence of actually who God actually is. But when Jesus comes along, He is light of lights. You see me? You see? Come on, you got to help me. When you see Jesus, you see? Okay. You see Him exact. Is that correct? And that's what Hebrews is saying here. So he's saying, like in times past, you only saw him dimly. You saw it light. You couldn't. God was a little bit skew with. You saw that other side of him. That other side that we, we kind of the severity of him. The, the, you know, kind of harsh side of him. But now we look at Jesus. We see everything clearly. We see everything perfectly. So, who do you think and what do you think should be the standard by which we live our lives? Jesus. Absolutely. So, if there's something in the Old Testament that I'm, I'm confused about, about the nature and the goodness and the picture of God, who do I need to go to? I need to go to Jesus. Because that doesn't, I'm not sure, if, is that you, God? In your own experience in life, in your own walk through your life, when you go through something and you go, man, because we've painted a lot of really weird pictures about God. <laughs> we really have. Right? You know, all the religions of the, 
of, of times past, and even ourselves, we get a little bit skew if with him, you know? And, and it, it's a funny picture that is painted that kind of leaves us kind of wondering, is that really how God is? Is that really how he operates? And I'll tell you what, it, it's, it's messed me up in my Christianity. I've had to deconstruct a lot of things so I could reconstruct them with Jesus. Jesus this morning is perfect theology. I might not understand everything, okay? But his life, his teaching, and his ministry is the standard by which I live my life. So when I'm confused about something, healing or anything like that, that's, that's in my life or in, in, in happening in the world... And you've got to get your head around this. Please, listen to me today. We've got to get our thoughts around this. Because if we don't, we stay in a, we stay in a religious kind of idea of God. Let me just say this. God doesn't always respond. In, in fact, I don't think He really responds to need. doesn't always respond to need. Okay, uh, my grandkids at my house, they've been sick lately. Uh, they, they were sick. We had them for two nights. Oh, thank you, Jesus. They were given back to their mother. <laughs> but when they're sick, You don't get me to respond to you because you're sooking. In fact, I don't like sooking. Stop your sooking. <laughs> no, don't sook. They have this huge need in their life. Uh, yeah, I am. I probably am. I'm a bad picture of a father. <laughs> so... so you know I go and pick them up and care for them. You know that, don't you? No, okay. Everybody's questioning me now. That's that, that's that, that's that reflection, isn't it? Hey? Okay. All I'm trying to say is that, is that God doesn't always respond to need. He responds to faith. When we get sick or something's going wrong in our life or, or, or we're just kind of in that dilemma of life, Right? God, why haven't you healed me? Why haven't you fixed me? You, can you see the need? Yeah. Financially, Lord, do you see this? Excuse me. Do you see this problem I have? Do you see the mismanagement of my finances? <laughs> and do you want to fix this? This is a need in my life. It is a need in your life. There is no doubt about it. There is a need in your life. And he just goes, yeah. What are you going to do about it? Suck it up. <laughs> we think that. We do. He responds to faith. Okay? See, this, this is a picture that we need to get, get straightened out. Because we think that he is like us. But he's not. Right? So what you do is you look to Jesus. Okay? Here's Jesus. This is, a, this is just great. I mean, there's a couple stories I could tell you. But here's Jesus. 5,000 people have been following him for a few days. And it's been growing. The crowds have been growing. They love, they, they're following him for the miracles following him for their, their needs to be met. Hello? Yeah. Yeah. And he's at a place, and all of a sudden the disciples say, they need to all go home now. Jesus, tell them to go home. We've had enough of these people. And they're going to be really hungry soon. Jesus, what does he do? He sees the need... But he doesn't respond to the need as much as he does 
respond to what are we going to do about fixing the problem, boys? And they go, we got a bit of fish, got a bit of bread. Maybe, maybe we could use that, you know. At least somebody came forward with some kind of answer. But what's, yeah, but what's this among so many? Here you go, here you go. How many of you know that five, five loaves, is it five loaves and two fish? Okay, how many of you know that wasn't going to go very far amongst 5,000? And this is just men and children, right? That's not going to go very far. Could have been 10,000 people there. That's a huge crowd. He says, what do we got? But he responds to faith. Right? He goes, just, just let's believe God. Let's believe God. Let's pray. Bump, ba -dum. Fill them up. They start going out. They get 12 baskets back. Isn't that crazy? Yes. See, God doesn't respond to need, but he responds to people believing God. See, you, you could mismanage your finances. That's, that's not okay, but we can do that. Things can happen or just something can happen where you just have a need, but, but you calling out to God, fix this, fix this, you see what? <laughs> He's gone. So what are we going to do? He might ask you to do something that's totally and completely irrational and illogical to you in the natural. He might tell you to give something away. Ah, wait a minute, I have the need. Are you, what's wrong with you? He goes, no, no, no. Goes, sometimes you have to sow a seed before you can actually reap a harvest. Oh, oh, it's back to front and upside down, isn't it? You lose your life to get your life. Oh, man, I never, oh, I never thought of that. He does everything so back to front to us. Are you catching what I'm saying today? And see, so what we've got to do is this transition is many times God trying to get you out of that old way of thinking, old humanistic way of thinking, Old Testament way of thinking if you've grown up in church like I did. And boy, it's hard sometimes. Because it's so opposite to what we, what we think, what we've been taught. And I mean, there's a multitude, there's a list of things. How many of you understand that? Yes. So if you're cutting a piece of wood, I'm just going all over the place right now, sorry. If you're trying to cut a piece of wood and you've got to cut, let's say, a hundred pieces of wood at the same length, you're building a house, so you all need them 23.80, whatever it may be. What is it, Steve? About 24? 2400 lengths of wood? Eight foot, oh golly. <laughs> he's trying to talk to an American right now. That's what he's trying to do. So let's say eight foot. <laughs> so eight foot lengths of timber, right? So if you're not careful, what you can do is this. You can pull out a piece of wood, get your tape measure. What's the tape measure? It is the exact standard by which you use. Correct? That's the standard by which you use to cut that first piece of wood. And all the pieces of wood from then on. Correct? So you can go like that, put it on there, pull it over to here, eight foot, cut that baby off. Now if you put your tape away, you put that one on the next one, by the time you get to the hundredth piece of wood, hundredth piece of wood, Right? You could be short by several inches. You could be it short. Because sometimes you might, it might not just be right on that end there. It might just slide that way a couple of mil, and then you cut it, and then, then the next one. And then you take that one, and you put that on it. Sometimes you could be out by, so your house is like the top of the house is running like this. You have to use the standard every single time. The Old Testament is not the standard. Good point. 
Jesus is the standard. Whether I can, whether I'm doing it exactly the same as his standard, not the issue. Whether I fall short of the standard is not the issue. See, what we do is we do, we, we take other church experiences and we take past church doctrines and past church history and we keep repeating it as the standard. Oh, that's how God is. <laughs> yeah, that's how he is. Oh, that's, that's how God really is in this way. And so we've cut off the piece of wood and it's just not accurate. Right? It's just not right. It's out of alignment. It's just not correct. Because you've got to go back to Jesus' tape measure. So if I question something in the Old Testament, something that I don't completely understand back there, something that I just, or an experience I have in my life that, that I try to put to it in a way of thinking here, what I end up doing is I end up messing up if I don't go to the standard. It's in every area of my life. You okay with that? You catching that? Okay. Okay. Because Jesus, this morning, is the standard. I've just lost myself in a multitude of places because I just got sidetracked. It's your fault. You know, Jesus is with his disciples one day, and they're walking through the, the a village in Samaria. As they get through this village in Samaria, the people go, we don't like you, get out of here, get lost. Two of the disciples come up to Jesus and go, <clears throat> you want us to call fire down? people don't like us. We're Jews. They're Samaritans. They're a hybrid of what we are. Listen to me. Let's call fire down like Elijah did in the Old Testament. Prophets of Baal. We'll get them, Lord. They're feeling pretty confident because they're hanging out with Jesus. They know that Jesus is the man. You say amen? They're trying to be impressive. And Jesus goes, what? What do you want to do? So, yeah, we want to call fire down on these guys. We want to bring some judgment upon them. Hello? Yeah, we want to call down the wrath and the fire of God. We want to fry them. And he goes, guys, you don't know what spirit you are of. I know what spirit they're of. They're of a spirit of the Old Testament. Can you say amen? I've come to seek and save the lost. We don't operate now in the New Testament like that. Old Testament, you touch a leper, you become unclean. New Testament, you touch the leper, the leper gets clean. Can you see that? So there's a huge shift that we've got to follow through in our thinking. A lot of the Christian world still believes that God is wanting to just pour out his wrath upon mankind for its sin. For its wrong. For everything that it's been doing. But let me tell you something. That Jesus took the penalty of the wrath of God upon himself. 2,000 years ago, he already took the rap for us. How many of you know that? That the justice and the judgment and the wrath of God was poured out upon Jesus. I'll share this in closing. There's so much more in my notes and I haven't even... 
I've just thrown them out the door because of you guys again. <laughs> this last week on Facebook, if you're on Facebook, you could probably find this in my, on my site. It's quite interesting because um, <clears throat> has anybody seen my, the post that I posted on Facebook? Oh, a couple of did. A couple of people did. Yeah. On the end times? The end times one? Yeah, okay. So there's this interesting one. I write up the top. I, I was, for some reason, I felt like being controversial this week. No. No. I'm sure that nobody knows me like that, but nevertheless. And I wrote up there, why I don't believe in the rapture. One day I will explain to all of you here all, all of my end times beliefs. I'll do a whole series on it one day. But it won't be in this building. It'll be in the building that we get so that we can all have a good meeting. And uh, it'll be different. It'll be good. So, <clears throat> And you don't have to agree with me. That's okay, guys. How many of you know? <laughs> that's okay. What's that, Diane? What are you being nasty for me? So. If they have been raptured before then. <laughs> Throw that chair at her. No. <laughs> Call fire down on that girl. Right now. How many of you know, even if I don't believe in it, and if it was still true, and it did happen, I would still go with them anyhow, because I'm saved, born again. <laughs> Do you believe that? So I have nothing crossed at all here. Nothing at crossed at all. <laughs> But I just thought, I thought in all of my studies, I, anyhow, I just thought, oh, I'll post this. This wasn't, it was a site that I go to quite a, quite a lot. And uh, anyhow, I posted it, and I just wrote a little bit of a caption up the front. Well, by, uh, man, I had several people say, you opened up a can of worms, didn't you? Because <laughs> one of the most controversial subjects is the subject of end times. People are so, I mean, this, it's like, that doctrine, that belief, you know. So, um, which is okay, it's good. And, and I have friends that still believe like I used to believe. And it's good because we enter into a debate and it causes them to actually kind of question. And what I want is people just to question what they believe. Because you know what? We carry over into our New Testament experience Old Testament thought. And Old Testament teaching, theology, and stuff that's just kind of doctrines of beliefs and all kinds of weird things. And even if you're not saved and you haven't grown up in church, you bring into the church your socialistic, evolutionary, whatever beliefs that you've had through all your education, through all the things and experiences that you've had in life. And they have to be challenged. Jesus came and he challenged the Jewish nation with, their, with his religion, with what he was teaching. And it was so contrary to what they believed, they hated him for it. It was the religious people that just put him on the cross. It wasn't the Romans, it was the religious people. And not all the Jewish people. Okay, get that right. It was the religious ones. They hated him because he was taking the people away from their, their God. Right? So we have to be challenged. And that's what I kind of sometimes like doing. Yeah? Because I think it's good. So it makes people think and start to be challenged. So anyhow, but it was very interesting because some of the comments that come back and one guy was trying to convert me back to what I used to believe. And it's like, you know, I already know this stuff and I've already, I've grown up on that. I know exactly what that says. But one of the teachings, part of the teaching that I used to believe is that one day we were going to be raptured. If you're, if you're a Christian here and you're going to be raptured out of here and if you believe that, great. If you don't believe that, that's great too. Um, I think if it does happen, we all go anyhow. But that's okay. You can... Anyhow. In the end. In the end. 
uh, it, it says a rapture, and then there's going to be what's called a, a, a tribulation period. Some people believe in, a, in a, a beginning of a tribulation, great tribulation, is going to last seven years. The first three and a half were supposed to be cruisy. The last three and a half, the whole world was going to be judged for its sin, and God was going to pour out his wrath again upon the world. Well, it just runs so cross grain with what I believe now, that whole teaching. And, and it's, it's because God's coming back to, to pour out his wrath again. I thought he already did that. Yep. Why are you doing that again? It, it, it paints a picture of God being kind of schizophrenic. And that's no respect towards him. How many of you know that? It's just we, we paint pictures of God. We, we make him up to be a certain way. And it, a lot of times it's just an Old Testament teaching that has actually crossed over. It snuck its way over into the New Testament how Jesus actually sang. He says, don't call fire down on these people. That's not what we do now. You say amen. I'm trying to show you the full picture, the full radiance of the sun. I am the light. I'm trying to show you the full essence of who God is. He's not just wrathful. He's not just a just, just and a holy God. But He is a loving, gracious, good, kind, wonderful God. You say amen. You know, um, God used to use, God uses me from time to time in words of prophecy. And giving words of prophecy and words of knowledge. And... Um, and I remember this one time, I was, I, was doing, I was doing evangelistic work, I wasn't pastoring a church at the time, and I remember I, was, I just drove by this building recently, and this thought came to me when I was driving by this building, that I'd given this guy a word, and it was very harsh. It was, it was a word of prophecy, and it was so harsh. I, 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 remember, I remember even as I gave it, I, at the end of it, I felt it was a God word. You know? And it was so harsh. By the time I, I... I remember driving away, and then six months later, this guy died. And it plagued me. It plagued me for a long time, and I thought, oh God, I don't want to give words like that. It's was, it was almost like calling fire down on this guy. And I, I just thought, man... And it just made me think, even this week, as I was going through this and preparing for today, I just thought, man, we just got to be so careful. I didn't kill him. Okay, guys, I didn't kill him. He died of a sickness. But how many of you know sometimes those kind of things can play on your thoughts? And it can be an attack of the enemy, enemy trying to, to discourage me and... and for not moving in that way again and you know and it did stop me for a while because I thought oh man geez Lord don't give me words for people anymore because if they die afterwards you know you have all kinds of thoughts that go through your head you know but it just made me think of that recently when I was driving by this building where the church used to be and I thought oh God got to help us let's not cross over Let's try to take everything back to Jesus. Yeah? Everything that we do in this life has to go back to the standard. And then you can cut. Amen? Amen. We still might not be, be completely knowing. We still might have some confusion. We still might not know everything, which we won't. We will. But at least he's the standard. You say amen? Hey guys, let's bow our heads, close our eyes. That help anybody? Okay. I, I just needed to, I wanted to preach that today because I just feel that we just need to know that God is good. And sometimes our, our, our mind, our thinking about God, our pictures of God doesn't always compute out to Him looking like He is good. 
it, it paints a different picture. Religion paints a different picture sometimes. And so we've got to be so careful that we don't paint that picture, but we allow Jesus to paint the picture of how God is. Jesus paints the picture of how God is. You see me? You see the Father. And ha Father, right now, we just pray, God, this would be sealed upon every heart and life in this place, that you administer your, your grace and your goodness to us. God, you'd help us to see you as how you really are in Jesus. Amen. Every doctrine, every belief that we have, let it be seen in you in the name of Jesus.